Well, hello, and welcome to the Growth Mindset Podcast. Join me, Sam Harris, on my journey of curiosity and growth. I have conversations with some of the world's most fascinating humans, from billionaires to Olympians, and most everyone in between, such as suspiciously happy people and even a hitman. Success isn't just for successful people, it is earned and you can earn it too. I find out how ordinary people become extraordinary to fuel your own growth mindset. Welcome to the Growth Mindset Podcast. Today we have Heather Thorkelson. She is a Canadian <laughs> dual entrepreneur living in rural Sweden. She grew up living all over the world and in her early 30s, finally took the leap to self-employment and never looked back. In 2013, she was living in Peru, working as an online business consultant before she then went to Antarctica and fell in love. Apparently, you can find love in Antarctica these days. I'm going to see. No, I'm going to the Arctic. Wrong place. I won't find love there, apparently. Just polar bears. In 2015, she opened up a second business, a polar expedition company, and has now just finished writing a book for incurable entrepreneurs like myself and probably many of you listeners, titled No Plan B, and it's going to be released in spring 2020. And on that, we have Heather Thorkelson. So can you add anything that might be missing from your life story, like earlier things? We started in the early 30s. What happened before then? Good question. I basically was working, did the usual thing. I went to university, got a degree, didn't know what I wanted to do. I actually dropped out of university halfway through because I thought it was not a good use of my time. I wasn't really impressed with the school. And I was like, I better go and have a gap year. Yeah, not a good use of my money. Yeah. So I was like, I'm going to take a gap year or something and go figure out what I want to do with this one sweet life. And so I did, I took off and I went and I worked in Japan for a year. Then I traveled around Southeast Asia, came back, finished my degree. And then from there on between 23 and 32, I worked a couple of different jobs, mostly one in education and one in the corporate world. The corporate world was the longest one working for a pharmaceutical company. And I absolutely hated it. Like to the nth degree, I found it really, really, really hard to work for other people. I found it really hard to work for companies whose vision and mission I didn't believe in and who I thought were engaged in practices that were not in line with my ethics. And I found it really hard to work with people who were trying to do the bare minimum at work and just get home as soon as possible because it's not really in line with the kind of person that I am. And I I just, it wasn't jiving with me. So When I took that job with the pharmaceutical company, I knew that it had a time limit. I was there for a specific reason. I was told when I was in the hiring process that if I stuck around for five years, I would qualify to apply for something called a global health fellowship. Not get it, but I would just qualify to apply. And I was like, oh my God, I have to do five years to to qualify. But it sounded so good. I thought, okay, well, let's see if I can stick it out. Let's see if I can manage working in this job. I could work from home, which for me, being the type of person that I am and being an introvert was ideal. So I worked from home, had the company car, all that kind of stuff. I had all the perks. It was still incredibly difficult for me to get through that five years. But when I finally got to the point where I could apply, I did. I got a fellowship. I got sent to Cape Town for six months to work with an organization that helped prevent mother to child HIV transmission in pregnant women. And that was completely amazing. And right at the end of my fellowship, I got word from head office that the whole company was downsizing because one of their biggest medications was going off patent. And I immediately emailed my boss back in Canada and I was like, downsize me because I'm leaving anyways. (laughs) Now that I've got my fellowship, like I put in my time, I did my thing. I'm out of here, you know? And luckily she was awesome. And she said, yeah, I'll throw you in the hat. So I got packaged off by that company and that was that, that was it. I was done with working for other people. And, you know, I, through a long convoluted way, ended up working yeah. for myself afterwards. <laughs> cool. <laughs> I spent some time trying to work for other people over the last few years and it concluded that I'm basically unemployable. Like, as in, if it is something I really agree with the mission and like I have the capability to be creative in what I'm doing, then like I can, it's not like I'm completely incapable of doing stuff. I can go and be really effective, but just sort of working for managers that don't always think in the best way and working with people that are just trading their time for money. is just like, yeah. Yeah. That's the thing. Like I'm not, it's not that I'm not effective. I'm super effective, you know, like I'm, Mm. because I'm a bit of a perfectionist, like I've got a really high work ethic and if I'm going to do something, I'm not going to do a bad job of it. But it's exactly as you say, like working in an environment where 
not many people share that and or your managers aren't interested in your vision or don't share any bigger, like, you know, sort of clocking in and clocking out. I just don't want to be a part of that world, you know? So I'm like super employable in one way, but also completely unemployable in another way, you know? Yeah, like yeah, I just, exactly. I, I can't do it. <laughs> cool. And so this then led to you moving to Peru to be an online consultant. So I left that company in 2010 and I had no idea what I wanted to do. Literally, I had no clue. I didn't even realize at the time that you could make an online business. So I kind of just hung out in the park a lot with my dog and like stared at blades of grass and cried. Just, you know, because when you've been, when your creative side and your ideas have been stifled for so long, you kind of forget who you are. I had a bit of a financial cushion, but I was living in Toronto, which is super expensive and I bought a house. So like I knew that the money wasn't going to last long. And I was just like, what do I do? And every door that seemed available to me, like go to a job, go back to school and get a master's degree and all these things. It just, when I thought about it, the psychological pain of considering those options was just unbearable. And so I'm like, I can't, I have to figure out another way to do this. But I was 32 and I didn't have any clue about how to work for myself. So I just started doing stupid little things. Like I opened up an Etsy shop and I started selling stuff that I made. So I was like, well, I'll learn about sales and marketing on a super low level with low risk. Then I decided, oh, maybe I should take certification in life coaching because then at least I have really good and well-developed people skills, you know, regardless of what I end up doing, that'll help me build myself now while I don't know what I'm doing. The life coaching thing turned into me starting to life coach people and, you know, via Skype and whatever, it basically turned into like a small little online business. And once I realized that I was totally location independent and just starting to make a bit of income with that, my partner at the time and I decided, okay, we're done with Toronto. It's been seven years. Let's get out of here. And we had both always wanted to move back to Latin America because we had both lived there in the past. So his company allowed him to work from the Lima office in Peru. And I was like, let's do it. So we rented out the house, packed up the dog and all the stuff we needed. And we moved to Peru and I worked from Peru. And because I was life coaching over Skype and running a business and starting to make money, a lot of people that I knew were like, what, how, huh? Huh?" Especially from my life coaching certification program. They were like, how is that possible? Are you coaching Peruvians? And I was like, no, 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 it's called internet. (laughs) So it sounds so funny. I sound like my grandmother talking about things, but like, you know, in 2010, there were a lot of people, there are still now in 2020 people who don't understand that you can do coaching or business consulting or whatever virtually. Right. So yeah, I did that. And it turned into very quickly, it turned into business consulting. It turned into teaching other people how to do what I had done. And I've never looked back by the time I, by the time 2012 rolled around, I ran my first entrepreneurial retreat in Iceland. Then I ran another one in 2013 in Peru and another one in 2014 in Peru and just started really working, you know, solely with entrepreneurs. Cool. I just to go back a little bit. So for life coaching, that is a qualification I have been thinking about doing because I, I find myself doing it naturally anyway all the time, but I think having a bit more of a framework around it would maybe guide me to not make mistakes and things as such. So what are the top tips you learned from life coaching? Oh man, well, the thing about life coaching that I think people don't understand is that it has really nothing to do with advice and it has everything to do with asking the right questions. So I agree. I think that doing some kind of, even just a short course to dip your toes in without doing any serious like year long program like I did, which was a huge investment. Um, Just doing a short course in it is so valuable because you start to see that there are ways of helping people and interacting with people that are so powerful and they're so much easier than you think if you know how to ask the right questions and not just the right questions, but how to approach these scenarios. I found the life coaching program I did just incredibly valuable in that respect. And of course, it plays into my work because I work with entrepreneurs. I work with people who live in a constant state of uncertainty, dealing with all kinds of internal dialogue about themselves and about their work and about their value in the world and all this kind of stuff. And so I think everyone should take life coach training. (laughs) And do you think everyone that you've coached, you'd have recommended that to? Because I mean... When I did my Vipassana, I was like, everyone should do a Vipassana. But then I'm not sure if it is actually right for some people. And, but then yeah. life coaching, I guess, is it like because you, you're more interested at a meta level about things? Well, I suppose I, I should correct myself and say anyone who's interested in any degree of self-reflection, yeah, go for it. If you're really not interested in that kind of stuff, you can take a pass. <laughs> 
So mo- most people really should should be doing this, and yeah, it would really help most people to get into self reflection. But maybe they might need to do some other things first to call to that interest to improve themselves to then go and do that. People think that you know you do a life coaching program or a course or a certification or whatever, like as a means to an end. Like I'm going to mm. take this, I'm going to study this, so that I can then do it in a professional capacity. And I think that's where some people have it wrong. You can learn about life coaching to help yourself, like similar to how you'd go to a vipassana or like you know like a silent retreat or whatever. You can do this to help yourself or a yoga training certification program. You might not be a yoga teacher afterwards, but like you've helped yourself mm. incredibly. Definitely. This is my problem though, is I keep on doing things just for my own interest rather than because I can actually go and do it. I'm like, yeah, the whole process of doing the whole thing afterwards, it's a bit much. Okay. Yeah. You moved to Peru and did things. And then, so how did you then transition from like just doing online coaching to coaching businesses and then running like actual events and stuff? Cause that seems like quite a big jump. Yeah. It seems like a big jump. Well, Sam, I just take the jump. I'm the kind of person that if I get an idea and I think it'll be really cool, I think, okay, well, why not? Like, what's the worst that can happen? You know? So when I put up the sales page for my first retreat for entrepreneurs, I was living in Peru and I was going to fly back north to Iceland, which is like super the wrong direction to go. But I'm half Icelandic and I love Iceland and Iceland was starting to, well, it had been really popular for a couple of years. So I knew that people would want to come partially because they wanted to go to Iceland. I had kind of a unique selling proposition in that I know it well. I have family there. I can take you like on the insiders thing. We're going to stay in a little town outside of the capital and like have a really great entrepreneurial like mastermind experience. And yeah, I put up the ad for it. I mean, it was pretty low cost too. I think I just broke even, but four people immediately signed up. It was like within 48 hours. And I thought, okay, well, that worked. <laughs> and then the next year, because I was living in Peru at that time, I thought, well, why am I going so far? I may as well bring people to my backyard because Peru is amazing. And again, you know, people were interested because they'd been following me online. I was blogging every week. I blogged every week for six years. So I had quite a big readership for that. And when I said, look, I'm living in Peru. I'm gonna, we're going to go up to the Sacred Valley. I found this amazing place that we're going to stay. That's not where all the tourists go. We're going to go to like the untourist opposite end of the sacred Mm. valley and i'm going to show you some amazing stuff and we're going to get out of our comfort zone and blah 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 so like it wasn't just that i was like life coach business coach big events it was sort of like i had cultivated the audience that was following my adventurous life already and when i was like come with me on an adventure and we're going to do some business stuff they were like yeah so yeah it just worked i just took the yeah yeah, that makes a lot of sense you alluded to blogging every week that's also an interesting thing. How did, is that like a, just a general habit of life or was there an agenda behind it? Or you just do your thoughts or what was the blogs about? That's what everybody was doing at the time. I mean, I started my business in 2011. Everybody was like, you got to have a blog and you got to have multiple opt-ins and blah, blah, blah. Mm-hmm. And I was like, okay, well, I'll start writing then. It wasn't just journaling. I had a lot of really specific things that I wanted to talk about. Taking chances and like resetting your relationship with risk and all this kind of stuff. I have a lot of really, really weird stories from my super weird upbringing, having lived all over the world. And so I was always weaving some strange story Mm. (laughs) into a bigger picture that brought it back to like, how do we show up in our businesses? You know, like, a lot of the kind of psychological stuff and I suppose like inspirational, motivational kind of stuff. And yeah, I don't know. People just really liked it. The blogging every week was really hard for me because writing is hard. I was an okay writer at the time. I'm a better writer now because obviously if you blog every week for six years, you improve, but it doesn't just come naturally. And yeah, so it, yeah, it wasn't easy. It didn't, it didn't come naturally to me, but I was like, this is what I do. This is how I market myself as a coach. I write and I put my writing out there. People find me, they connect with me, they hire me. So I was really, really consistent with it, including when I went to Antarctica, I had a virtual assistant, like satellite connection was free because it was pretty much the only time I could get onto the internet at midnight on a ship in Antarctica. I'd like send off my blog post the night before it was going to be published to my virtual assistant who would then put it up on my website. So yeah, I was pretty, pretty consistent with it for six years and then I stopped. I am delighted to tell you about today's sponsor. Orgain's Grants for Greater Good. Orgain are literally giving away $150,000 in grant money. So it's not really like a very salesy pitch, this one. They're here to give you money. You run a business that works in nutrition, mind-body wellness, or promoting healthy lifestyles, then this is for you. 
So we all know that it's challenging to start a business and the right support and money can really help you go a long way. And that's where Orgain wants to come in. Just a little bit about Orgain themselves. They are a convenient and clean nutrition company. And it's a brand that was founded by Dr. Andrew Abraham, who originally developed a nutritional shake whilst he was trying to beat cancer that he had in his teens, just to help himself like nourish his body. And he realized that his recipe was really useful and he wanted to share that with the world a lot more than being a doctor. So he founded Orgain to make the world healthier. So yeah, Andrew knows from first-hand experience what it's like to change the world one idea at a time and that these ideas can often struggle to get the financial support to get off the ground. So he wants to pay it forward. Nice guy. Orgain will choose three deserving startups and grant them each $50,000 each to help take their business to the next level. To apply for the program, your startup needs to be two years or older and in the business of promoting healthy, vibrant lives, either through nutrition, active lifestyles, or mindfulness. So the application period ends on the 20th of March, 2020. If you think that your business is a good fit, please visit orgain.com slash grants to learn more. That's orgain.com slash grants. That's super cool though. I certainly agree that writing is very hard, but can we go back to, you said you used to weave in your stories. I quite like that in my own writing I kind of find that I've got lots of silly kind of fun stories that relate to like meta principles in life and it's a certainly part of my writing style but do you have any stories that you could give an example of that worked really well in your blog like one of your favorite blogs like took off I think the one that I wrote really early on like in the first year of writing that made quite a splash including like someone who I have huge respect for I think she's an absolutely amazing writer and she wrote me and was like this blog post blew my mind. And it was, for me, it was like having Oprah send me an email and being like, I love you. I was just like, huh, what? Like, it was amazing to me. And it was a, it was a blog post about basically how I had had pretty severe social anxiety my whole young life. And I told you before that I went to university for two years and then I dropped out. And the reason that I dropped out, aside from just that I wasn't happy in my school and I was super depressed, like I'd gone to high school in Costa Rica and then I'd come back for university in Canada. And I just had really bad reverse culture shock and I had really bad anxiety and I was in a dark, dark place for two years. And so then I was like, okay, I hate myself right now. I hate my life. I'm constantly hiding from everything. I don't have any friends. I don't fit in in Canada anymore. I'm super social. I'm an introvert, but I need to be around people. So we all need friends, right? And I just was like, I was really suffering. And I thought, okay, how can I blow everything up? Like, how can I completely change my reality? I'm tired of myself. I'm tired of my own terror about life and about being out in the world. And so I thought, okay, how do I get over this? And I thought, okay, well, it's exposure therapy. Why don't I just throw myself into the fire? I'm going to go to one of the busiest, most people places that I can think about. I'm going to go somewhere where like most people don't speak English, at least they didn't back then. It was 1998. <laughs> and just go where I'm going to be in a constant state of discomfort and see if I can survive. So I did. I dropped out of university. I went and lived in my sister's basement for three months over summer and worked a really crappy job stocking shelves from 5 a.m. to 9 a.m. every morning. Saved up, I think, about $3,000. And then I flew to Japan with a backpack, three grand, and no job, no place to live. Like I literally remember in in the blog post, I write about this, that I like came up from the subway after having left the airport, took the subway down to some hostel that I was planning on staying at. And I don't know if you've ever been to Japan or any listeners have been to Japan, but like when you come up out of the subway in Tokyo, nothing makes sense. It's just like, there's a bazillion people everywhere. There's a million signs. You have no idea where you're going. You don't know, you can't read the signs, you know? And like my hostel was on the 18th floor of an office building. So I didn't even know how to find the office building. And so I remember standing there on the corner, the street corner in Japan and just being like, I'm going to barf. Oh my God, <laughs> I'm, I'm going to die. Like... Uh, I was so, I was just standing there like absolutely paralyzed. And I was 19, I think at the time, actually, I can feel it in my stomach right now, reliving that moment. And then I just started figuring things out. Like I faced my fears that day. And every day after I was in a constant state of terror for like the next year and it completely changed my life. You know, like it completely changed who I was because I suddenly realized that like, I will always be fine. I will always find the answer. I will always get by. I will 
and not only that, but like I made some amazing friends. I got a Japanese family who I still to this day adore and I'm in really good contact with. Like there was so much beauty that came out of that. It's a really cool story. Thanks. I have been to Japan and yes, it's mental <laughs> and crazy. And yeah, it's, it's something you kind of learn from traveling. It's like things just can go completely wrong, but like it ends up fine and yeah. it's so useful. But I do kind of worry that like, these days it is much easier to travel. You've got like Google Translate and you can always see where you're going on the map and you don't have to ask people for directions and all these things that used to go wrong, you're not so used to dealing with. So when things go like more wrong, it's, it's like yeah. more hard. Whereas yeah. you know, your phone does so much for you these days, it's kind of, it was always there to help you with like the problems that you have. So backtracking a bit, you said that you had a virtual assistant. How did you go about setting that up? So that was quite a long time ago as well, back when that wasn't such a done thing, but super useful if you can make it happen. Yeah, I just knew kind of early on that I didn't want to deal with things like the back end of WordPress. Like I can, and I built websites for a while. So like I know how to do all that kind of stuff, but I just don't like admin work. I find it very boring. And I thought, well, how am I going to focus on the stuff that I should be focusing on? Oh, I'll just hire someone. And so there was another coach at the time, Michelle Ward. She's called the When I Grow Up Coach. And she was quite sort of like internet famous in my circles. And I think I did a guest blog post for her and her virtual assistant was awesome. She was my interface and she was so awesome that I emailed her afterwards and I was like, hey, are you looking for some extra hours? Because I need a virtual assistant and you're so on it and you're so good with people and like, that's what I need. And she's like, yeah, sure. So I just hired her and we worked together for like the next three years until she stopped being a virtual assistant. That's how I got started with that. Nice. It's a bit of a risky move to make really is the whole like stealing people's virtual assistants and things. I guess if she was actually... Like not full time. No, that's the thing. Like she had space for extra hours. So she continued Mm. working for Michelle and then she took me on as well because I was only giving her maybe five hours a month, but it was enough. Her Mm. doing five hours of work saved me 10 hours. It's amazing how much people can do. So how did you go about structuring their day? Was it just you had like some very specific tasks that you could give them for the month and that was that or... Yeah, pretty much. And it's the same as what I do now. Like I have two different people working for me right now and they just have their tasks. And if there's deadlines, then they know what their deadlines are. And we talk in Slack and, you know, like I just ran a project last month called Own Your Shit, which is all about entrepreneurs showing up as they are, not some like sort of beiged out, like generic Mm. (laughs) business. And so for that project, obviously we needed like graphics for every day of the month and all kinds of stuff. And so I was just getting the information from my contributors from all the different entrepreneurs who were telling their stories and sending it over to my virtual assistant and being like, Hey, can you make up the graphics for me and like prepare the newsletter? And then I would go in and like finesse things and write a little bit, send it all out. So we have a really good partnership in that way. And you know, now that that project's done, she's going to be working on some other stuff for me, doing some PDFs of some information and Mm. yeah, whatever I need that is just not my area of genius. I just, I have her for depending on how much I need her five or 10 hours a month, not even that much. And I, if I need her for more hours, then I ask her if she's available and I pay her for more hours. But it's such a really small cost. And like, she has a good rate. I pay her well, but it's in the scheme of things, it's such a small cost for the amount that she takes off my plate. So I don't have to worry about it. Yeah, definitely. I think one of the keys to getting more successful is just working out how to outsource yourself and scale yourself so much faster. That's why yeah. I was interested to ask about it, really. With a virtual assistant, to be honest, it's a little bit more straight up in the sense of, I will say, I need you to do X, Y, and Z. Is there any of this stuff that you don't like doing, full stop, or you're not interested in doing? And luckily, because they're pretty good people that I've hired, they're straight up with me and they're just like, no, yeah, I'm totally cool with that. Like, I don't mind, or I really like doing travel bookings. Like, I've been doing it for ages. I could do it on my sleep, you know, that kind of stuff. I've done a lot of hiring also for polar expedition companies, my own and and another one that I work with. And that one is a little bit more tricky because you need to be looking a lot more at the personality type of the person. And I'm always looking for people who have a strong sense of personal responsibility. So the types of questions that I ask are usually situational. Like, give me an example of when you've dealt with a really unhappy customer. And, you know, how did you handle it? What did you learn from it? That kind of stuff. And, you know, how do you feel about X? Or how do you feel about Y? Like, when we work on teams in the polar regions, you have to be really, really good at teamwork. And there's specific parameters that I can ask about you know, related to teamwork. Because if you get someone on a team that's like to ram through with their own way of doing things, it's going to fall apart pretty quickly and you're going to become the hated, most hated person on the team really fast. <laughs> so, so it's a lot of situational questions that I ask people. And then I just, I really, at the end of the day, I look for a very strong sense of personal responsibility. 
Because if I know that you're going to stay up super late to fix the problem, if it's necessary, then you're going to be the right person for me. But if you're like, not my problem, I just work here. I don't want you in either of my companies. That's very useful advice. Thank you very much. And then I guess that leads directly into how did you set up a polio expedition company? That's pretty cool. Yeah, that was another thing where I just kind of saw an opportunity and I thought, well, we should do this because I'm really good at seeing opportunities and I'm not really good at seeing like the barriers to those opportunities. I'm just like, well, we'll figure it out. So I was living in Peru, as I mentioned, in 2013. And my partner who I'd moved there with, our relationship had been kind of on the outs for quite some time. And so it was about month 18 around in my online business. And anyone who's done an online business, they know that like that 18 month mark or like two years, you're you're really, you've been working your buns off and like you kind of feel a bit of burnout. And a friend of mine that I knew from years and years ago, from all of my travels growing up and everything, contacted me and said, hey, I know you're working for yourself. I know you've got a life coach certification. There's this new company in Antarctica, Polar Expedition Company, that needs someone with your skill set. Would you be keen to come down for six weeks and start up this role? And I was like, oh, I would love a chance to take a break from this computer business, <laughs> from sitting in front mm-hmm. of my laptop and like, you know, coaching people. So I jumped on it and I just told my clients, look, I'm going to be away for six weeks and I'll be back and we'll carry on as we were. And they were all really fine with that, which was great. And I took off and I went and I worked in Antarctica and it was just such a great break from my normal life. I had been there as a passenger before in 2010. So, you know, I already had been to and loved Antarctica and the chance to go back and like get paid to do it. Off I went and did that. And over the course of that six weeks, I realized like, wow, once I leave, because this role didn't exist before I did it. Once I leave, they're going to be screwed for the rest of the season because nobody else can do this role. And so I talked to the president of the company who I reported to directly. And I was like, I kind of think that I should be coming back because what are you going to do when I'm gone? And he was like, no, good point. Like, can you come back? And I was like, yes, I can because I work for myself. So I make my own rules. So I took a small break over Christmas and then I came back and I ended up staying the rest of the season. And in the process, met a guy who was one of my colleagues on the ship, a Swedish guy, and we fell in love over the course of that season. And I should say that before Christmas, I had already broken up with my partner back home in Peru. I realized, wow, I like some major changes need to happen. So they happened. And by the end of the season, I had a new boyfriend. And a year later, we were married. So that was an interesting ride. And then that was 2015, we got married. And that was also the year that we decided, or I really pushed my husband and his twin brother. Can you imagine two big Swedish dudes, twins, yeah. both working as polar expedition leaders? Everybody knows who they are because they're absolutely like the most recognizable dudes in the polar regions. And I was like, why don't you have a company? You need to have a company. Like, why are you working for contracts? If you're not on a ship, you're not making any money. That's not good job security. Like, what are you going to do? You know, you're going to do this until you're dead. That's not going to work. And they were like, oh, no, we're not entrepreneurs. We don't do that kind of stuff. And I was like, no, 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 but I am. (laughs) So like, let's join forces, you know? So we did. They're basically the outward facing, you know, sales and marketing for our company. And I'm the behind the scenes business person. And that started in 2015. And by 2018, which was about two years ahead of schedule, we started chartering our own vessels and taking people on 12 passenger ships to the Arctic up to see polar bears and that kind of thing. And we're an agency and an operator. So we sell trips on bigger ships and we run trips on small ships. And it's been cool. pretty, pretty cool. Lots of interesting things. I, I guess I would also like to, just like to know a bit more about life on Antarctica. So I do really like stepping out of kind of what you feel like is reality and just experiencing different realities. So I went to North Korea and it was actually quite nice to sort of be in somewhere completely different and like not have any of the normal conventions going on. But yeah, what was it like in I've also worked in oil rigs where it's just complete isolation and it's it's a very strange place to be, but I'm saying lots of stuff. Can you paint a picture for me instead? (laughs) For sure. Yeah. Antarctica is really, really unique in that way. And even the Arctic to a certain degree, but especially Antarctica, because you're so far removed, right? Like in order to get there, you have to sail for two days across the Drake Passage, which is one of the most volatile passages of water in the world. And then you like come across the continent of Antarctica with these dramatic peaks and snow and penguin colonies everywhere and like whales breaching and icebergs the size of office buildings. And and I remember being in Antarctica and just being like, I'm so small. (laughs) I am such a tiny little speck. Like this world is so huge and mother nature is everything. She's so powerful. And I am just nothing. And I don't mean that in a like, I don't matter kind of way. I just mean that it gave me such perspective on my life, on my place in the world. I was like, why am I so stressed out? Like, why not just 
try to do what makes me happy. Right now, I am not happy. How do I move towards more happiness? And, you know, it was a really cool thing as well, being on an expedition ship at that time, because as you say, you know, you are with your colleagues, you're all living together on a ship. We had 100-ish passengers on each trip. Each trip was about 10 days, so we'd rotate a new 100 passengers every 10 days. But the expedition team, which is between 12 and 13 people, was more or less the same people. And so they become your ship family. They become the people that you're like, collaborating with all day, every day you're working with, you're like, you know, I mean, you're working 16, 17 hour days and relying on each other. And you're in an environment where if something goes wrong, if the weather is bad and you're driving Zodiacs and someone falls out, like you could die. Like there's a real chance of death if you're not cautious and careful and looking out for each other and making sure that the guests are doing what they're supposed to be doing. And, you know, I mean, we're all trained, obviously we have a high level of training for safety. So it's not a real risk in that sense. It was intense. And when I left, when I went back to Peru and that little time off in between my first contract and my second contract, I really missed it. Like I really missed the camaraderie. I really missed, I really missed being out and away from the whole world. You know, Lima has 11 million people in it. (laughs) And I was like, oh, just take me somewhere quiet. Antarctica was the best. That's maybe why I like North Korea so much. (laughs) And then, yeah, I definitely get that kind of feelings and it's just so nice to step out of things with like, your, your phone and just like being in city. So there's just so much, you don't really have time to think about what it is you're doing because you're permanently doing it. It's just so nice to sort of just be like, yeah. oh wait, I'm like this kind of little yeah. thing that doesn't really matter. I should think a bit more about what it is I'm doing rather than just constantly doing things. And it's nice to step out of things. Back in 2013, 2014, when I first started going down to Antarctica, we in theory had internet on the ship, but like it never worked. You know, like I said earlier, I'd be up at midnight, like next to the Wi-Fi signal on the bridge trying to send something off to the real world, you know, we didn't, we weren't connected. And that was the best, like the absolute best thing ever. These days, the Wi-Fi is actually quite decent. So, you know, I've got colleagues on the ship down there that are sending pictures and video out on Facebook. And I was like, oh man, seven years ago, you couldn't load Facebook to save your life if you were in Antarctica, you know? So things have changed a lot. Yeah, it's a shame. I'd rather go and be off grid. I really would. Having experienced it, I'd rather be off grid any day. Yeah, it's so annoying when you get to like amazing places and there's tourists there that are just constantly like on Instagram and stuff and like you're not even like experiencing it because if you're behind the phone the whole time, you're like, ah, oh. <laughs> what was the point? As in, you yeah. can just look at these photos anyway online. <laughs> People are better at taking photos than you are. Yeah, that's true. Okay, so we should talk about your book. Sounds super cool. Can you tell me why you started writing it and some of the big lessons? So I started writing it because I had had a book in me for a long time. I knew I wanted to write a book largely because the stories that I used to write on my blog resonated so well with people, but also because over the years of growing my first business and then starting my second business and now in the process of potentially developing a third business, which I can't talk about, but it's exciting if it comes to fruition, I started calling myself an incurable entrepreneur. You know, I started thinking about like, there's no going back. There never was an option to go back into the working world. You know, like I'm out of the matrix. I've taken the red pill. <laughs> like yeah. I'm done, you know, and this is where I am. And I'm going to keep running these businesses or starting new businesses or helping other people build businesses forever and ever. Amen. Because that's what I love to do. That's my zone of genius. You know, it's really exciting to me. We have this term and I think even Brian Clark has a podcast called unemployable. And I definitely consider myself that we talked about it earlier. I'm like super employable slash unemployable, but I don't like the negative connotation of unemployable because it mm. sort of says like, I, I can't hold a job. And I don't think that that's true at all for most people who are quote unquote unemployable. I think that I prefer the term incurable entrepreneur. Sure. I could like, I could rock it. I could be your, whatever your CEO, but I don't want to be because I need to be out here in this bigger sandbox that I've created making my ideas come to life. That's what fires me up, you know, and then looking at other people's visions and helping them clarify those visions and put the steps in place to bring those to life. That like, I mean, Ooh, I can feel it in my body right now. Just talking about it makes me so happy. And so all these things just started to crystallize about a year and a half ago. And I was like, okay, now's the time I got to, I got to sit down and write this book. And the, the title came to me right away, which is, you know, cause people always said to me, like, how did you get into this? And I said, well, I left my job and then I just knew that I was never going back. Plan A is this way. Plan A is self-determination. I am going to create my livelihood and there's no plan B. There's no defaulting to a job ever again. And so I called, I've called the book No Plan B. It is a how to be an entrepreneur book. It's basically walking people through who you need to become 
in order to bring to life the things that you want to bring to life. So I talk a lot about the psychology of entrepreneurship, of living, as I call it, outside the matrix, you know, a lot about the psychology of uncertainty and risk and developing your decision making skills and grappling with fear and uncertainty and dealing with other people's perceptions of you and all that kind of stuff. Cool. Yeah, it sounds really interesting. It sounds like a lot of kind of things I really like writing about and sort of relate to. So yeah, pretty fascinating to see what see what it's like. Exciting. All right. How did you go about finding an editor and like putting the process together of being a, an author exactly? It was personal recommendations because I have a pretty strong entrepreneurial network these days. And so I just went out to people that I really know, like, and trust. And I said, look, I've written this book. I need to work with an editor. Who do I need to talk to? And everybody that I knew screamed one person's name. And I was like, oh, (laughs) guess I better talk to her then. So I spoke with her. Her name is Rachel Allen. If anyone wants to write a book, she's your lady. Yeah, we had a conversation about my book concept. I sent her my original crappy first draft, as I like to call it. And she was like, this is going to be amazing. We got to bring this to life. And so we spent the next six months going through and rewriting the book. And a developmental editor, for anyone who's listening and doesn't know, is someone who takes your ideas and puts it into a sequence that takes your reader along a journey. So they're Mm -hmm. basically helping you develop a story and a cohesive narrative that takes the reader on a journey and helps them helps them really get the most value possible out of the stories and the information that you're sharing. And I do have a ton of crazy stories about my life and about the businesses and like massive fails and stuff, you know, because I'm not one of those people who's sitting around there going, oh, look at me, lifestyle entrepreneur, everything's peaches and cream. Like a lot of stuff happens that's not glamorous at all. There's a lot of days that feel really bad. There's money lost here and there, you know, and I bring all of that out in the book and I talk about the reality of it. In fact, the first third of the book, I'm essentially trying to scare off anyone who isn't the right reader. (laughs) Mm. I'm like, you know, here's the reality. If this is not you, or if you think this sounds terrible, put this book down now and walk away. And if what I'm writing excites you, or if it resonates with you, because that's your reality as well, keep on going. Nice. So you are self-publishing then? I am self-publishing. I have a couple of people who really like my work and they're sort of lobbying on my behalf to see if possibly I might be able to get a book deal. So there's a chance that that might change, but the plan right now is to self-publish. And everything I've done basically working with Rachel, the developmental editor, she is really seasoned in that. And so she has a lot of great contacts. And so when I needed, for example, a book designer and a line editor, she was like, here, here are my three best options. I think you should talk to one of them or here's my two best options for this. And so I've just gone through her recommendations and found the ones that I'd like the most. So everything I didn't, I haven't had to do any of this just completely flying blind on my own. I've leveraged other people's experience and other people's expertise and other people's connections so that I don't have to try to do everything myself. I can just do the thing that I do, which is write, call in the troops to help me get this thing out into the world. They say like the main skills required to be a good entrepreneur are being able to build a network and being able to outsource. It sounds like you're great at both of them. So we haven't actually gone into like, how did you build the network? You just said that you have a great network. Uh, that would be quite useful for leading into yeah. how you'd be able to have a network to be able to write a book and such. I wish I had an easy answer for that. But to be honest, there wasn't anything in specific that I did other than just be doing this for a long time. I've been now working for myself for nine years and I have done my very best to show up in my work and in my public persona and my private persona with as much integrity as possible. And so that has drawn in a lot of really great people and it's meant a lot of really not so great people have fallen to the wayside. And that's just made my network really, really strong in the process. The people in my network are people who they like what I have to say. They have recommended clients to come and work with me. And those clients have been very happy and vice versa. It's just being around for a long time, showing up with integrity, doing the things that I say I'm going to do. You know, like we all kind of feel, many of us feel like we know each other. I mean, you even found me through someone who's in my extended Mm. network who... I've never met her. I don't really know her. I know of her. But to know that people who are like five degrees away from me are recommending me to other people, that you know, that's nine years of being in the public sphere and saying things that matter, really. And I think the other thing too, in terms of building a good network is that it's not something that happens by accident. You actually have to show up and like show people that you appreciate them. So when people recommend clients to come and work with me, I send them stuff in the mail, like the person who recommended the other person, you know, like I'll send them a gift in the mail and a card. And I'm like, 
this means a lot to me. Like your recommendation means I get paid. That's a big deal. And that's your reputation on the line. Because what if I suck? I don't take it lightly at all. I make sure that people feel really appreciated because I think that that's really important. And some people, I will actually go out of my way to say, hey, do you want to have like a virtual like coffee on Skype just to catch up, you know, once a quarter or something? Because I know that I really like their work. We wouldn't otherwise run into each other because we live in different countries. And I want to, I want them to keep me on their radar and vice versa. So there is some intention there for sure. Good networks don't just happen. So is there anything else that you would say is like an actual thing that you've done that helps? So do you kind of have like a reach out on LinkedIn method or anything? nothing like that? Because like I, <laughs> yeah, I wasn't I thinking that was going to be the right I, example at all. But I'm no, like, no. But like, I think a lot of people are looking for that. You know, a lot of people yeah. are like, oh, what can I do? Like, is there a certain thing you say on LinkedIn, or is there a way that you like? I wish, I wish there were, because that would be easy, right? But there's not because I'm, I have such an allergy to like any yeah. marketing tactics or connecting tactics that feel in insincere. And I think they can be done sincerely. I just haven't figured that out yet. Yeah. Know? So then. I guess for me, it's in like running a podcast is like a sincere way of doing that because like I get to have a cool conversation with you and like I'm doing something useful for you. I'm talking about your book and that helps you, but I'm also yeah. helping everyone that listens because I'm making an interesting conversation. But now I have a, yeah. someone else in my network. And yeah. so I was going to say, did, did you like ever do guest postings on with your blogging, like get other people to come in and talk about their lessons or anything? Or? A really long time ago I did, but I've just not been blogging for since like regularly since about 2007. So yeah, nothing like that recently. But by then, my reputation was solid. Yeah, I guess if you're doing lots of like event stuff, and like with the Arctic expeditions, I guess most people are kind of who who comes on those. They're like rich people, like business people, is it scientists? No, uh, not not business people or scientists per se. There are scientists who do polar work, of course. But uh, in the Antarctic, where we do not run our own trips, that's just yeah. anybody and everybody. Sometimes it's rich people, but it's a lot of just normal people who really want to get the seventh continent knocked off their list. But you'd be surprised. Like there, there are actually, I mean, I've traveled with people who are like 20 with their backpack and they're just like, yeah, I've been, I spent half my money traveling around for six months and the other half is to pay for this because like it's such a big deal to knock off your bucket list. So yeah, generally it's a bit older people, a lot of baby boomers, that kind of thing. On our trips in the Arctic, we get definitely a more well-heeled passenger. So usually people 55 to 70 who have some extra cash and they don't want to be on a big ship with a bunch of other people. They want a more bespoke travel experience. So yeah, that's interesting too. And that also working in that environment has also really helped increase my network. That network is completely different from my business Mm. consulting network. Like they're literally two completely different worlds. And then, of course, similar to you, we have a podcast for the Polar Expedition Company called Antarctic Stories. And I get to interview some of the most amazing people for that. And that further increases my network on the polar side. Because now if someone says, oh, you know, I want to talk to someone who's done X. And I'll be like, oh, you should talk to so-and-so. We had them on the podcast. And the polar world is quite small. So that's been really, really an interesting networking opportunity as well. Nice. Thanks. That's a good advice. You've been like all over the world, living in different places. What made you end up living in Sweden? Because I love Sweden. Sweden's amazing. And it, I wish I could say that it was like, oh, I'd always dreamed of living in Sweden. But the truth is that I never imagined in a million years that I would live in Sweden. I just didn't, it didn't occur to me. But my husband is Swedish. So when we met and fell in love and got married, it only made sense, especially because we decided it didn't make sense for him to continue working on ships all the time. I have a business to run. Now I have two businesses to run. And I, I can't, I was working on ships to be with him and getting really frustrated because I, you know, I mean, it sounds like a terrible thing to say I got tired of going to Antarctica because you never tire of going to Antarctica, but I got tired of working on a ship because that's not what I do. I, I was literally just there so that I could be with him. And I was like, I need a home base. I need somewhere, or at least I need to be on dry land with a Wi-Fi connection so that I can actually continue to run my own business and run our business twin tracks. So what can we do here? What's a happy medium? And we decided to settle in Sweden so that he could become a Swedish Coast Guard. So that's his day job. And then he moonlights as a polar expedition leader for our company and also occasionally for other companies. So every now and again, we escape off together and go do a trip in Antarctica or go on one of our own trips in the Arctic. What are the kind of trips that you do then? The trips that we operate ourselves are right now in Svalbard, which is northern Norway, which is considered one of the best places in the world to see polar bears in the wild. A colleague of ours described it as 
if you, if you can imagine someone chopped off the Swiss Alps, dropped them in the Arctic Ocean and sprinkled polar bears all over them. <laughs> That's pretty much what it's like. We operate in Svalbard and we, this last season, did our first trip to Greenland. So we're going to branch out and do more of Greenland as well and possibly into northern Canada. Nice. I'm, I'm super excited for my trip to Svalbard. It's just looming, which is one of the other reasons why I think I got put in touch with you because someone said that they knew someone that knew something about Svalbard, basically. One thing I have been wanting to ask is, what's it like having a husband who has a twin? <laughs> it's mostly funny because people mistake them all the time, like their colleagues, mm. people that work with them quite regularly. And to me, they're not identical, but they look uh. so similar that most people mistake them. It's bizarre. So for me, it's really just a funny thing because people will see the two of them together and be like oh which one's which and i'm like are you kidding <laughs> what, what would you say is it just like somehow that just like the way they, they move their head and everything hold themselves body sort of stature or yeah i mean my husband's brother david he's a little bit shorter and a little bit broader so like when i see there i was sitting up in svalbard actually we were up on a hike with i was sitting with a passenger up on a hill and my husband's brother was walking down the hill and he was maybe i don't know 300 meters away And it was the backside of him. And Mm. Tammy, the passenger, said to me, can you tell them apart? Like, when you're looking at him now, would you know if that's Rickard or David? And I was like, absolutely, in a heartbeat. I said, because I can see the ratio of his torso to his legs and the way that he walks. Like, my husband does not walk that way. Oh, interesting. Because I've obviously never had this issue. But, you know, it does make you think, like, hmm, what happens? That's uh, an insight for me. And, okay, so lastly, what is one of your very first memories? One of my very first memories? It's kind of strange. When I was really little, I was probably about five at the time, maybe four, possibly five. My parents took our family on a vacation to Mexico. And at the bottom of the swimming pool at the hotel that we were staying in, this massive flower was painted on the bottom of the swimming pool. And for some reason, it was burned in my brain. I I was really afraid of swimming in the pool because I thought the flower was going to close up and like swallow me into it. I had this really weird imagination. I was a very weird child. And so I was like equally terrified and fascinated by this flower on the bottom of the swimming pool. And that is probably my earliest memory. Cool. Yeah, I still don't know why I asked that question. Exactly, I just find it really kind of weird and interesting. Nice. Yeah, I've, thanks. I've never been I've never been asked that, but I'm glad that you did. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Some people have like really weird stories, and some people are just like I don't know. But I think it's just kind of interesting to see how people work and what like sticks in your brains when you're young. Yeah. Anyway, what is the <laughs> kindest thing that someone has done for you? Oh, the kindest thing that someone has done for me. I don't think that this gentleman realized it, but when I was just finishing the in-person portion of my coach's training. There was another man that I was, that was in my class. There was probably like 20 of us, something like that. And he was just another guy who was taking the same coach's training as me. And I was, and he had no way of knowing this, but I, I had a really bad upbringing. And at that point I had been estranged from my father for many, many, many years. And in my upbringing, my father had been really, really emotionally abusive and made us, I have two sisters and he had made the three of us just feel like absolute nothing, you know, like absolute dirt. And this man, this sweet man who like, I don't even remember his name. At the end of our long weekend together of this intensive coaches training, he came up to me and he's like, hope you don't find this weird. But I just wanted to tell you that you are one of the most creative and inspiring young women I've ever met. And if my daughters grow up to be half of the woman that you are, I will be the proudest father. Even now, I feel so emotional saying that I almost burst into tears standing in front of him. And the kindness of him to think to tell me that, I'm not even kidding. It healed like years and years and years of like crap and trauma. Yeah. You know? Wow. Yeah, it's yeah. a nice thing. Yeah, it's really funny that how some of these things can make such a big difference. Yes. Is there anything you really haven't said that you'd like to say as a useful take home? I suppose to anyone listening, what I really want everybody and anybody to know and to consider is that if you feel like you have unlived life in you, don't stop. Don't let that just simmer. It is such a true thing that every day that goes by is a day that you don't get back. And if you're just biding time, if you're just saying, like, maybe later when I'm more ready or I'm more this or I'm more that, don't let that keep you in stasis. Don't let that unlived life hide away because life is so amazing. And the only thing between you and like the great things that you could do, even if they're not anything massive, like maybe you just have never been on an airplane before and you're 41 like me. And maybe you've been thinking about get get on the airplane. You know, it doesn't need to be massive things. You don't need to create businesses. Just like do those things that you've been longing for because you don't know if 
tomorrow that chance is going to be taken away from you. Thanks. Heather isn't like plucking herself too much, but you should go and buy her book when it comes out because it's going to be <laughs> awesome. And I think you have a website. Yeah, heatherthorkelson.com. And you can find me on all the socials just at mm. Heather Thorkelson. All right. Well, thank you so, so much for being on the show. Yeah, and thanks so much for having me. What a delightful conversation with Heather. So she has a lot of great tips, mainly just show up regularly. So she did the blogging, which may not be the answer anymore, but she just showed up every week with it. And it was a regular commitment where she was just useful to other people and it helped to really build her network, which leads into the next point of just invest in your network, like just be useful to other people and give them the time and say thank you whenever you can and make sure that the connections stay as real connections. And then you can really get a lot out of it in the future. And basically, if you are an incurable entrepreneur or someone that just needs more challenge and adventure in your life, just go and do it. Like her book states, there is no plan B for people like us. So just do what it is that you need to do. If that's going to the Antarctic, then go do that. Maybe you'll find a husband or wife. Hopefully this happens to me soon. And yeah, I'll probably try reading her book. It sounds really good. And on that, have a great week. Congratulations on listening to a whole episode of the Growth Mindset Podcast. Before you race into another podcast, try pausing. Ask yourself, what have you learned? What could you change? How will you make that change happen? Did you press pause? Knowledge is useless without action. What did you learn? What should you change? And how will you make that change happen? You can tell us what you learned by contacting us through the website, growthmindsetpodcast.com. And feel free to connect with us or our guests, or just peruse the show notes. Our Instagram is at growthmindsetpodcast, or follow me at samjamsnaps for a daily reminder to stop using Instagram. If you enjoy random acts of kindness and want to support the show, you can support us on Patreon or leave us a review on iTunes, and you'll make me very happy. And with that, keep learning and keep growing.